Welcome ladies and gentlemen. So what I'd like to do is describe to you what inverses of functions are as well as how to determine them. But before we get started, I kind of want to do a quick little activity that I did in my classroom. Um, and the basic thing is going through you know, two sets of operations that you should be familiar with if you're, starting, if you're talking about inverses of functions. The first one is just evaluating an expression. And you know, really evaluating an expression, we're finding the value of that expression. You know, so we could say it's equal to what value. Um, so if I plug x into 2, it can say 3 times 2 you know, minus 1. I'm still looking for what that's equal to. 3 times 2 is going to be 6 minus 1 is now equal to 5. Okay, so we could say that the value of the expression is going to be equal to 5. Then we started going into uh, solving for equations. And a couple of the vocabulary that we were for solving equations was inverse operations and properties of equality. So again, when we want to solve, we want to solve for x. That means we want to isolate the variable. And to isolate the variable, uh, what we're going to do is actually a couple things and one more thing, reverse order of operations. Notice here, when I did this, I followed the order of operations, right? I multiplied then I subtracted. And that was very important because if we didn't follow the order of operations, everybody would get different answers, right? If you're deciding to subtract before you multiply, you're going to get a different answer. So when solving, we follow the reverse order of operations. We want to solve for x. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to undo subtracting by 1. So to undo subtracting, we're going to take the inverse. Notice how undoing and inverse are connected. Right? So I plus 1, then I get 3x is equal to 6. Now I need to undo multiplying, so I'm going to use the inverse operation of multiplying, which is dividing. And you've got to make sure you divide on both sides, which would be the property of equality. And then x is going to equal 2. Okay? So when we're looking at any function, you know, let's just look at f of x equals 3x minus 5. When we're looking for the inverse, we're going to use the inverse notation like this. Okay? It's, it's going to be like f raised to negative 1. It doesn't mean raised to the negative 1. That's just the inverse notation. But basically what the inverse of this function is, is the function that undoes the function. That's the easiest way I could say to kind of think about it. We think about inverse operations as undoing each other. And really for this function, you can kind of think if you plug in x and then you get to y, like if you want to, if you want to now plug in y and get to x, you got to apply the inverse function. And that's how they're kind of related. Again, I'll kind of say that if you take, you know, take x, you plug x into your function, and you're going to get you know, your y value. Well, the inverse function is if you plug y, it's going to take you back to x. Okay, So what it also does, it kind of talks about taking you to its identity element, taking you back. And another way I looked at in class is you know, if you put on your shoes and then take off your shoes, you're back to where you started. Well, putting on your shoes, you can think of as the function. Taking off your shoes is like the inverse function. So it un they undo each other, and they take you back to the identity element. So when they take you back to the identity element, which would just be x, that comes into play a couple um, important ways. First of all, let's look at the graphs. So if I wanted to find the graph of a function, the the easiest way to find the graph of a function is by really just actually graphing them and understanding that there's a relationship between the function, between the graph of a function and the graph of its inverse. And basically, they are going to be reflected about the y equals x line. And again, x is the identity. Okay? So if I had a function that looked like this, then if I wanted to graph the inverse, I would basically just reflect it about the y equals x line. Now, uh, this works in a couple different ways. And if you were, this works in a couple different ways, or a reason why this works is let's just kind of look at some points. Let's pretend this point here is 0, comma y. Well, then this point, right, when it's reflected across, is now y comma 0. Because remember, if you take 0 into y to get your function, well, then when you plug y into your inverse function, you should get back to 0. Right? That's how that was the description of the invert of a function in this inverse. You you know you you go in one way, it's undoing itself. So if you plug zero, if you plug zero into the function, you get y, or sorry, zero into the function, you get y, and then you plug y into the inverse function, you're gonna go back to zero. It's gonna take you back to that identity element. So this whole swapping of variables, and actually, I don't know why I'm using, let's just use x and y. Here's some, well, let's just use A and B. I don't want to get confused with all the stuff. Therefore, then, this is B comma A. Okay? So basically what you see is if you plug in A, you get to B. Then the inverse function, you plug in B, you're going to get back to A. But what's also a thing is you notice is these variables are swapped. 
right? So basically whatever would be in place of them are getting swapped. And that's important when we start looking at functions as far as writing the equation of the inverse function. So let's go back to our function 3x minus 5. So the steps for finding the equation of the inverse of a function is basically you're going to replace f of x with y. And the reason why is because you can do everything you want with f of x. You could treat this as the f of x axis, or you could treat this as the y axis. So it's really no different, but the operations are basically the same, and it's a lot easier to work with y. Um, so you know, usually a lot of times, I'm not going to have you write down steps, but you replace your f of x with y. It's easier, or, or if you already have y, you're good to go. Then the relationship between a function and its inverse, you notice that the coordinate points are swapped. So if these x and y represent coordinate points, then you swap them. Then to solve for this, you're going to use inverse operations to now solve for y. So you could write it as y inverse if you're originally given an equation as y. Or you'd use function notation. Okay. So the um, the other important thing I just want to mention to this is why you know why would this be important? Well, one of the biggest things that this is helpful as far as a function and its inverse is to be able to identify um, the domain and range of a function. So if here's your function, each function has a domain and a range. But remember, the domain is the set of all x values, and the range is the set of all x, y values. Well, if the coordinate points are swapped, what you'll notice now is that the domain of the inverse is the range of the function. So if you're given a function and you're asked to find the domain range, you can usually, typically, we've learned a lot you know, how to find the function or how to find the domain. But range gets a little bit more difficult when we're looking at equations and we're not as aware of what the graph looks like. But if we can algebraically determine the inverse of that function, then we can find the domain again because the domain of the inverse is the range of the function. So there it goes, ladies and gentlemen. That is just a basic little definition for you of inverses of functions. And I hope you learned a little bit. Keep on working hard. Stay curious. Thanks.